So, the first video I ever posted on this channel was on how I thought Astra's business model was unsustainable. Uh, my thought was that Astra would eventually be overtaken by reusable rockets. I knew that reusability was the future, and that while reusability favored larger payloads, it would only be a matter of time before they eventually became cheaper than even the smallest expendable rockets. And in that video, I depended heavily on the cost per kilogram metric to drive my point home. And it was a decently crafted video, and among the YouTube space industry community, I was not alone in that sentiment. Here's a clip of Apogee, a YouTuber I very much respect, saying basically the same thing. You may have heard it said that you wouldn't charter a 747 to fly something across state lines, you would take a small Cessna. This isn't actually true. If it was the cheaper option of the two, you would take the 747 almost every time, no matter how overkill its performance may be. The same will be true for Starship. Just because it has a massive capability doesn't mean it must be relegated to flying only massive payloads. So this is what I thought would happen to Astra, but I really must say that I have changed my mind and I do have to admit I was wrong on this one. Surprisingly, the thing that made me change my mind about Astra was watching an interview with Peter Beck. Instead of explaining how that happened, I'll just roll the clip. You know, rockets are almost never uh, packed to the brim, you know, with their full capacity. Half, you know, no. most of the time they're flying well below their capacity. Um, Correct. So, so eight, you know, eight tons. And, is... and by the way, you don't get a discount for that as a customer, like. Whether, right. you, whether, you, whether you fill the rocket or you don't fill the rocket, when you buy the rockets, the cost is the same. Right, exactly. So if you have a cheaper ride, period, that's the, the bottom dollar, the, the, the amount of the check yeah. is, is what matters most to the customer at the end of the day. Th this, is, this is where the whole cost per kilogram metric falls over. It's a great mm -hmm. metric that, you know, that, that accountants and, and bankers can understand very easily. But the reality is that almost nobody buys a, buys like a, a rocket on a cost per kilogram basis. It is. Yeah. How do I get this particular mass to this particular orbit in this time frame, and what's the lowest cost that I can do that for? So I don't know what it was about this clip in particular, but it really did make me realize that I was putting too much weight on the cost per kilogram metric, and I really should be looking at absolute cost. And when it comes to absolute cost, no one really comes close to Astra's ambitions. Astra's eventually planning to launch a rocket with a 500 kilogram payload for $500,000. And I'm willing to give them credit for half of that. Let's say they can launch it for a million dollars. No reusable rocket will ever launch for a million dollars. Even the smallest fully reusable rocket planned, the Terran R, I don't ever see launching for lower than five million on the customer end. Bringing two stages back to the pad, one from orbit and refurbishing and refueling and certifying them, all do have their logistical costs, and I don't see that ever completely overshadowing the cost of building a rocket as small as Astra's. So instead, what I thought was an inevitability, now I'm more willing to admit might never actually happen, and there might always be a demand for a rocket as small and as cheap as Astra's. So does that mean there will always be enough demand for Astra to conduct 300 launches per year? Still probably not, but will there be enough demand for Astra to keep existing as a company, to stay afloat? That's far more reasonable and I'm willing to open my mind to that possibility. So again, to restate, when I originally said that Astra's business model was unsustainable, I made the amateur mistake of overstating the cost per kilogram metric and understating the logistical costs of reuse. So in fact, I have changed my mind. Now is this enough to make me an Astra Bull? Well, that's what we're going to find out today as I look through a short seller report that just came out from Carousel Capital. Are these short sellers going to make some valid points against the company, or are they just going to make the same naive mistakes that I made in my first video? Let's find out. Okay, so I've got the short seller report pulled up right here, and we're just going to go through it and see if we agree with what's said, or if we can spot any BS. Let's go. 
We are short shares of Astra Space, a $2.8 billion space launch company found and formed at the peak of the 2021 SPAC bubble with no revenue, no track record of reliability, and no established market for its undersized vehicle, a story stock that's yet another example of the questionable businesses going public via SPACs, Astra faces massive obstacles in its quest to develop a, a viable business model. Astra is poorly positioned with an overcrowded market for small launch vehicles. Its main competitors will soon be launching larger 1,000 kilogram plus payload rockets while Astra has yet to overcome the developmental hurdles necessary to successfully launch even a single satellite into any of the emerging broadband mega constellations. Shortly after Astra announced its SPAC merger, the company increased its payload capacity goal uh, and signed a secret deal with a competitor for access to some of the competitor's more powerful engine IP. I'm guessing that's referring to the Reaver engine. Moreover, Astra short-sightedly relies on cheap, off-the-shelf commercial parts, a strategy that precludes it from exploiting the economic advantages of its more that its more sophisticated competitors enjoy by developing reusable rockets that in the long run reduce expenses. Okay, this is what I, what I have said about Astra in the past. I have I have questioned whether or not they are too short-sighted. Astra's investor pitch boils down to selling the pipe dream of an unprecedented number of cheap rocket launches. Astra, Astra's forecast calls for 300 launches per year by 2025, a whopping 10 times more than SpaceX, SpaceX achieved in 2021. Not one expert whom we interviewed, nor any independent market study we reviewed, offered any reason to think that industry-wide sufficient market demand will exist for Astra to sustain approximately daily launches by 2035, let alone 2025. Post-merger cash on hand, originally touted as sufficient to fund, fully fund the company until daily launch in 2025, is now only enough to cover monthly launches in 2023 meaning Astra will almost certainly need to tap the capital markets in the upcoming year. Okay, I just read the abstract, and I have, you know, some things I agree with, some things I can potentially defend Astra on, um, but I will wait to go through those things individually as we go through the, uh, the full report. Executive summary. Okay, here's where we get going. Astra's rocket pr launch projections are nonsense. Uh, no market analysis supports Astra's planned 300 plus launches by 2025. I do have to agree with them on this one. 300 is just ambitious. I think 100 is still would still be kind of insane uh, for 2025, especially for a brand new company like Astra. I do have to give this to them. So Carousel one, Astra zero right now. Astra is falling behind its competitors. Multiple industry executives were interviewed who routinely secure launch services for small satellite manufacturers on a global basis, agree that Astra's rocket dimensions and payload capacity are well below the sweet spot of customers' needs. Rocket Lab, Relativity, ABL, and Firefly all have plausible plans to produce 1,000 kilogram plus rockets that will be entering the market in the near term. By contrast, Astra aspires to produce a 500 kilogram rocket two years from now. Astra's attempt to catch up is self-evident. Shortly after its back announcement, Astra publicly disclosed an increase in the targeted capability of its rockets shortly thereafter, and surely to Astra's embarrassment, the public learned that Astra had entered into an agreement allowing it limited access to study one of its competitors' rocket engine IP in exchange for $30 million. Okay, this one goes to Astra. This one this one goes to Astra. Hang on, my hair is ridiculous right now. Um, and I'll tell you why. Um, Astra is falling behind its competitors. Um, they're again going for rocket size, 1,000 plus kilograms versus 500 kilograms. Again, with the size of satellites today, 500 kilograms is more than enough to launch a whole lot of satellites, like a whole lot of satellites. So I do have to give that one to Astra. And when it comes to uh, studying a competitor's rocket engine, they're referring to Astra uh, gaining the rights to the Reaver engine, uh, Firefly's Reaver engine for $30 million. And that's an incredibly good deal. One of the good things about Astra is they're not paying for R&D like all these other companies. So this is actually a win for Astra. Um, so yeah, um, it's one to one right now if you're keeping track. But yeah, this one definitely goes to Astra. This is, this is nonsense.
Um, expect many more failures as Astro ramps up its launch efforts. Astro is playing a risky game. It needs to ramp production and prove reliability of a cheaply built rocket while maintaining access to public markets and fund cash burn. We believe Astro's reliability goal for its rockets is 80%, which itself is not exactly confidence inspiring. According to a well-informed source, however, at its current stage in development, rate of Astro's rockets failing may be as high as 1 in 2. Yeah, but, you know, same thing with most rockets. Um, should Astro encounter even one high-profile failure, consider damage to Astro's reputation and development plans seems inevitable. Yes, but they're launching uh, unmanned satellites, so it's never going to be as high as a manned launch failure. And this one... I don't want to give to either uh, side. We just kind of got to wait and see um, whether Astra delivers. And that's that's what a lot of this comes down to. It's just whether Astra actually delivers because I no, no longer have any long-term concerns about their potential. It's just whether they can deliver or not. Okay, next one. Six months into public life and Astra has already missed expectations. So yes, they have, they have missed... 2021 EBITDA will come in 35% below original SPAC forecasts, and even with the benefit of delayed CapEx, Astra is burning cash rate of 50 to 60 million per quarter. Even only five months after closing a deal that placed nearly 500 million in cash in Astra's balance sheet, the company has already walked back being fully funded to 2025. Instead, it indicated it will only have enough cash to get it through some time in 2023. Yeah, that's not good. That's not good. We're going to have to give that one to the short sellers. Um, but we still do need to do a full video on Astra's financials um, to see exactly how much cash they do have and where their break even currently lies um, to see if we can actually, you know, maybe become Astra Bulls eventually. I, I, I want it to happen. I want it to happen. Okay, next one. Astra's strategic direction lacks differentiation and raises concerns. Okay, um, this one's about their new constellation, which uh, is years behind Starlink, Kuiper, OneWeb, and Telesat, and I have to completely agree. I'm not going to pretend to have any clue what Astra has planned for that constellation, so I'm, a, I'm also going to have to give that one to the short sellers. Okay, they're just giving us the launch history here. I think this is just this is just complete nonsense, okay? It takes a whole lot of tries to get something to space. Like, you could easily just do this with the Falcon 9 program, the Starship program, and just put fail, 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 fail next to every single launch attempt and ignore the fact that, you know, they learn stuff after each launch. This is the type of stuff I actually don't want to see in this uh, short sell report because this is not actually a bad thing. Anyone who, you know, understands the development of any launch vehicle will understand that this is not a bad thing. And I hope that there's less of this nonsense and, you know, maybe more damning information about Astra. But if they just fill it with stuff like this, um, it's just not convincing. So this is more nonsense right here, just the size comparison chart. Uh, definitely targeted at people who don't understand space exploration. And again, if I see more of this, it's making me less convinced of this whole short seller thesis again. Um, small launchers have played an incredible role in space exploration. Uh, the Electron was a wildly successful vehicle, and if they're just trying to attack Astra's rocket because it's small compared to all other rockets, it shows that this is the best they have to attack the company over instead of, you know, more substantive research. Um, I hope the substantive research is coming a little bit later, but this is just, this is just nonsense. Okay, so they're just going to casually put the Vega rockets and the Terran R and the Firefly Beta and the Epsilon vehicles on this chart and not question those launch vehicles at all, not question the whether or not those will come online, but they're questioning Astra's launch vehicle. Yeah, so they're asking questions about Astra, having doubts about Astra, but then not having similar doubts about other companies that they very much should have doubts about. Um, and they're not drawing the same, you know, level of comparison. And if you're going to be short on a company, if you're going to try to pr produce damning evidence, you really have to give them the benefit, benefit of the doubt so that there's no, there are no holes in your argument. There's no, you know, wiggle room. There's no lying by omission. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. 
Um, so this is just not, not that impressive so far. We're gonna keep going. Their next claim is that their planned daily launch cadence uh, far exceeds the addressable market. And I've looked through this uh, segment. I don't see anything new introduced. This is definitely a genuine concern and it definitely deserves its own separate video. Um, but they do have some interesting quotes in here. Um, there's no way they're doing 300 launches by 2025. By 2035, it would still be a stretch. That's from a senior engineer launch booker. No name on that, um, but some senior engineer. Um, okay. Um, a competing small launch provider is saying we uh, all around the industry are in the same spot. Um, yeah, even within Astra, uh, we're looking at a tenth of Astra's rockets and are still freaking out. Are we going to have enough customers for this? Okay, interesting. Last one is just a lot of issues with their rocket and their business model claims of launching every day. I have some serious concerns about Astra's claims. Yes. Um, yeah, we all have some concerns about the daily launch claim, but I think overall still Astra is spending, you know, nothing on due diligence because they're just taking everyone else's tech and buying stuff off the shelf. They have proven that an off the shelf rocket can get to orbit. You know, they did get to orbit and they're still planning to launch, you know, smaller and cheaper than everyone else. So it's still within the realms of possibility. I don't think they're gonna get to that launch cadence of 300. I think that's off the table, but I still, think there is demand for this cheap kind of launch. But now what I'm trying to decide is if the company still has legs competitively, and I still think that's well on the table. Without high launch cadence, Astra's business model falls apart. This is the next part of the short seller report, and actually a pretty important part, because if they can't survive without the extremely high cadence that they're claiming, that's a big problem. So they're saying that even if Astra were to achieve what we would characterize as heroic, an unprecedented launch cadence of one rocket per week in 2023, the company's own projections indicate this would result in a deeply negative EBITDA and free cash flow. Okay, that is important. What actually makes them positive? Where is their break even? That's kind of an important question for us right now. Oh, no, never mind. They tell us right here. Uh, only with over 100 launches, well above our estimate for the entire addressable market in 2024 slash 25 and generously holding price constant at 3.75 million per launch and giving the company credit for lowering costs to 1 million, does Astra begin to break even on a per rocket basis? So 100 launches is within the ballpark um, for sure, but that's just right on the edge. So. <laughs> We've got some research ahead of us to see whether or not Astra really does have a future or not. Okay, investors should be asking whether Astra devised a launch cadence to meet market demand or to merely solve for the inherent weaknesses in its business model. Damn. Okay. So, I mean, one of the things I have been thinking is that, you know, it's not surprising that Astra hasn't been, you know, planning to develop any bigger rockets or any reusable rockets because it's not like they have enough money to do those things. So I've kind of respected, you know, Chris Kemp for keeping his head down and staying focused on, you know, what is within Astra's capabilities. And, you know, there is a whole lot of demand for, you know, small launches, you know. I'm personally just starting to get a glimpse of the small launch market because Harvard is currently working on building a small satellite that they plan to launch in 2023. And I have been starting to get a bit of the customer perspective and, you know, there is really something to be said about wanting to launch when you want and getting to an orbit that does benefit you on a schedule. Um, you know, and I've gained a whole lot more respect for that as we have been looking for launch providers. So there is something to be said about that um, at the end of the day. So I'm not fully willing to give up on Astra quite yet uh, because of that. But yeah, there are a whole lot of bear cases that need to be addressed. Um, but I still haven't seen any bombshells that, you know, have really caught me off guard so far. Okay, this is exactly where we go. Um, <laughs> they're doing marginal cost benefit of reusable rockets. This is exactly where I was in my first video comparing Astro to the Falcon 9 and the Starship. They're giving Starship $20 per kilogram, but they have 
but they're giving Astra $2,000 per kilogram. You know, I was giving Astra $2,000 per kilogram, but I would do that way before giving Starship 20 bucks a kilogram. They don't have questions about that. That is my problem. They're not asking questions. They're not being bearish on other companies the way they're being bearish on Astra. And I, for that reason, it's hard to see the comparison is fair. Uh, Cause there, there are a whole lot of questions you should be having about Starship. Um, just with how massive it is and how complex the engines are um, in whether or not the refurbishment cost will ever be able to get that low. Um, but they're not asking those questions about other companies, they're just asking them about Astra, which is a bit biased, so we're gonna keep going. Okay, and if we go to the launch price comparison, this is exactly what I was saying about Astra. This is their estimated price. Um, you know, Falcon 9 rideshare, you know, they're putting in one million. Um, but besides that, Astra, 3.75 million, lower, absolute cost is lower than the rest of the field. And that's exactly what, you know, that, um, that Peter Beck interview was talking about. You know, absolute cost, at the end of the day, it's worth a whole lot more than us, you know, armchair rocket scientists um, really give it credit for. Um, and this is where I'm still seeing that Astra does have value um, at the end of the day, and no one can take that away. Um, okay, that here they're calling the Firefly engine deal a sign of weakness. No, this is a sign of them not spending money on DD. Uh, this is complete nonsense. We're gonna keep going. <laughs> okay, so they do go after Astra's acquisition of Apollo Fusion, saying that it's an example of a company making decisions based on what it must do given the limitations of its rocket, not what the market wants, and not what a company without such limitations would ever devise. Um, which I'm a little bit skeptical about just because space systems is just a massive expanding market. Um, yeah, just because space systems is a massive expanding market, you see Rocket Lab building their Photon, SpaceX building Starlink, um, and all these other launch providers starting to do things in space other than just putting things in space because there's a whole lot of money to be made there. And you know, Astra's going about it just like everyone else, and I don't necessarily think they should be attacked for it. Again, you know, we'll have to see whether or not they're successful in those endeavors, but I'm certainly not mad at them for conducting such endeavors in the first place. Broadband constellation plan is a pipe dream. There we go. This is one thing that I have serious questions about. Why are they competing with Starlink? You know, I already have so many questions about Starlink. That's, that's its own um, video but why does Astra think that they can compete? So I'm going to definitely read this right here. Okay, so um, they're saying that neither Chris Kemp nor Adam London has any experience in the satellite um, design or network operations field, which is true, but the Holicity chairman does have some experience in the cellu cellular telecom world. Astra is no closer to having broadband constellation than a Nikola truck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can't disagree. I, I can't disagree. Um, Astra has enough on his plate just trying to launch a basic rocket into orbit without blowing it up half the time. If the objective is to deploy a broadband mega constellation, it's far more cost effective to use a larger vehicle. Yeah, no, they don't have a vehicle suited for completing their own needs. They're going to have to go to other companies if they're going to want to deploy 13,000 satellites. Yeah. Um, they continue to say it's worth pausing to note the absurdity of the FCC filing. Astra has never built a single satellite. It has not yet proven it can reliably execute on its core business of launching small rockets. Yet it filed an application for a constellation two times larger than the next largest proposal from Amazon. Yes, while the application technically amounts to little more than a procedural land grab from Spectrum Rights, Investors should be concerned about how and why a launch company still working out the kinks of rocket development would even want to contemplate the endeavor. Unsurprisingly, Kemp seems to want to avoid talking about the entire project. Yes, big red flags all over this um, endeavor, I do have to say. Spaceport availability is a key logistical hurdle. Um, management habitually describes Astra as having a flexibility to launch from anywhere in the world, which is simply not true. Okay, yeah, it is simply not true. Just because a rocket can be transported in a shipping container doesn't mean one can lift off from any Walmart parking lot. <laughs> okay, we've gotten to the conclusion. Let's read it. The next several months are critical for Astra. Agreed. Already falling behind with an undersized rocket, Astra has no room for setbacks, which is a problem. Also agreed. 
Silicon Valley's move fast and break things innovation approach may come may work when it comes to software development, but not for a rocket company whose rockets are prone to unexpected explosions. It has serious consequences. The only way to improve reliability is to continue testing and failing, which with each successive failure, soon to be conducted under the spotlight of Cape Canaveral rather than the backwoods of Alaska, proving harder to spin as positive. If Astra were private like most of its peers, this wouldn't be such a challenge. Having an uncomfortable conversation about delays or needing a pivot with a small group of long-standing investors may not be easy, but at best it's having to answer new, fickle public ones. The froth has come off this new space market as investors watch yet another SPAC fail to deliver on lofty projections and with its cash balance burning away like a rocket with a fuel leak, which Astra has experienced, Astra shares will be left smoldering on the launch pad. Damn. All right. So overall, nothing new, but a solid report. I don't think they missed anything in this what 20 plus page report. Astra has a whole lot of an uphill climb. I do think they have the potential to be around long term, but they have a whole lot to do to get there in the first place. Again, you know, 100 launches a year to break even, that's, that's a lot to ask for. Um, and whether or not Astra, you know, even has the money for that, you know, again, they're down to like $2 billion market cap. That's less than ABL, which is private. Um, yeah. We're going to be tracking them a lot over the next few years to see if they can actually pull this off. Because, I, you know, I want them to be around. You know, I have so much respect for all the incredible pioneers and really experienced individuals who are working to make this company work. I think they do have a sound value proposition. Um, but they do have a lot of obstacles ahead of themselves. So yeah, um, if Astra does get dirt cheap after this, um, report and doesn't get any higher, you know, I might buy some more, uh, just cause it'll be, you know, so cheap, you know, why not? And we will be tracking it actively. And if we think Astra's done for, we'll, you know, we'll get out as soon as we can. But I still think there's potential for this company and, you know, I want to help the space industry grow, not hurt it. So I'm not quite ready to, you know, hop on the, the short bandwagon, but you know, leave your opinions in the comments. I, I want to know what exactly you guys are thinking. Um, I know I'm going to get that video out reacting to the rocket lab versus Astra comments. Um, I have been really sick, so I, I haven't been able to get it out yet, but it will come out, you know, shortly after this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already, uh, like the video and goodbye.